Brandon went from a promising early pick in the Major League Baseball draft to spending the rest of his life in prison. A young man who had everything to succeed in a promising sports career, money, and loving parents gradually sank into madness until he committed the irreparable. Brandon Willie Martin was born on August 24, 1993, in California. His father, Michael, was African American, and his mother, Melody, was Caucasian. He had a two-year-old brother named Sean. Brandon and his brother had a very happy childhood surrounded by friends and family. They belonged to a large family, Melody had 14 siblings, and the family was very close-knit, with uncles, aunts, cousins, and nieces and nephews regularly seeing each other. Brandon's parents always encouraged their two sons to participate in sports from a young age. The two boys will play baseball, football, and basketball. Brandon was therefore very athletic, and in high school, he was one of the stars of the baseball team. His classmates and coaches had high hopes for his future career. He graduated from Santiago High School in 2011 and immediately signed a lucrative contract with the Tampa Bay Rays. He had a very promising future, and he even received a signing bonus of $1 million. His contract also provided for $144,000 to finance his university studies. To summarize, at 18 years old, Brandon Martin had just signed a professional baseball contract for a million dollars, and all of this quickly got to his head. He rented a magnificent house and bought a chain of beautiful cars, and unfortunately, Brandon loved to party. He really loved partying, alcohol, and drugs. In November 2011, Brandon rented a five-bedroom house in the Glen Golf Club community in Corona for $6,000 a month. They organized many parties where many guests under the age of 21 consumed drugs and alcohol. During the four months in this house, the police were called no less than 19 times, with frustrated neighbors reporting noisy parties, guests urinating on their lawn, and scantily clad girls dancing on tables. However, he also contacted the police for fights when the parties got out of hand, Brandon will even be arrested twice. On the field, things are going rather well, but after a successful season, Brandon moves into a new house where he continues his wild parties. But of course, this lifestyle will soon have repercussions on his athletic performance. In 2013, he fractured his left thumb, and after his recovery, he was assigned to coach a minor league bowling team at It Runs. Gradually, Brandon's behavior became alarming. He became defensive when confronted about his lack of seriousness during training and started laughing for no reason. He became extremely paranoid and even claimed to be talking to the dead. These were the first signs of psychiatric disorders. To make matters worse, his daily consumption of marijuana exacerbated his mental health issues. His relationship with his coaches deteriorated during training, and he became increasingly disrespectful and unable to handle criticism. Later, they would say that, with several decades of experience, it was the worst behavior they had ever seen from a player. After failing three drug tests for marijuana and getting into a fight with his coaches, he was sent back to his parents' home to seek treatment. However, the homecoming did not go well. Frustrated and angry, he continued to smoke daily and vented his anger and hatred towards his family. On February 5, 2014, he got into a fight with his brother Sean and broke his finger while attacking him. The Rays, his team, decided to suspend him until September 2014, and on March 26, 2015, they released him from his contract. His baseball career was now over, but the worst was yet to come. Brandon was broke. He had spent all his money, he was angry, he was living with his parents, and he continued to use drugs. He felt that he is not supported by his parents and develops a genuine hatred towards his father. Brandon has always struggled with his mixed race identity, and he blames his father for his skin color. He even uses skin lightening products regularly to whiten his skin. His father, Michael, age 64, is disabled. He is diabetic and spends his days in a leather armchair or a wheelchair. Michael is very weak and needs his left hand to support his right hand when he wants to, for example, pick up a glass to drink. He is also unable to transfer himself from his armchair to his wheelchair. One day, during one of his fits of rage, Brandon punched his father in the head while spewing racist insults. These attacks against his father would occur several times. Brandon harbors a deep resentment towards his father because he is black, and unfortunately, as his biological father, he too has that black part in him that he detests. He hates his father and, by extension, himself. During his attacks, Michael, being a diabetic and physically weakened, was unable to defend himself as he could not lift his hand without the help of his other hand. Brandon is a high-level athlete who is in the prime of his life. However, he displays increasingly concerning behaviors, often yelling, arguing, and hitting walls while alone in his room, causing his parents to worry. After these outbursts, his parents can see fist marks on the walls of his room the next morning. One night while Melody was asleep, she woke up to find her 21-year-old son Brandon standing next to her bed, watching her sleep. On September 13, 2015, Melody asked Brandon to clean his room, but he refused, insisting he was hungry and wanted to eat. She insisted on cleaning his room immediately, which led to a violent argument. 
Brandon grabbed his mother and hugged her tightly before grabbing a pair of scissors and pointing them at her throat while shouting that he wouldn't be able to play baseball again as long as his parents were alive. Melody did not report this incident, but the news reached a member of the family, Mike, Brandon's cousin. On September 15, 2015, Mike contacted Brandon, asking him to come over to his house so he could correct and hit Brandon for attempting to strangle his mother. However, Mike disagreed with this violent approach and immediately informed Brandon's parents, urging them to come to the house to see what was happening between Brandon Brandon and his mother. When Mike's parents, who are Brandon's uncle and aunt, arrived at the house, Brandon refused to come out of his room or talk to them, shutting himself off and remaining silent. Mike will alert the authorities, and the police will come to arrest Brandon at his parents' house. He will then be placed in provisional detention pending his trial. On November 15, 2015, Brandon was sentenced to five years in prison for aggravated violence against his mother. This sentence will put an end to Brandon's descent into hell, and he will now have to face the consequences of his actions. The police arrived shortly shortly afterward at Martin's residence. Brandon was interrogated and admitted to strangling his mother, but he claimed that he did it in self-defense. He told the police that he was seeing a therapist but was not taking his medication anymore. The officer encouraged Melody to file a complaint, but she did not want to. She did not want to file a complaint against her own son. Brandon's parents then asked the officer not to arrest him. They were afraid that it would put an end to his career. Brandon had signed a million-dollar contract four years ago, but he had spent it all and had nothing to show for it. His team had just released him from his contract due to his behavior and addictions. But his parents hoped that their son would get his act together and be able to play baseball again. The psychiatric pharmacy then offered them another alternative. They proposed putting him in internment detention to submit him to a 72-hour mental health examination. At first, the parents were opposed to the internment, but the police officer did not give them a choice. At this point, it can be observed that Melody did not cooperate with the police at all. All she wanted was to protect her son. She did not file a complaint and was also strongly opposed to his internment. However, it should be noted that Mike, her cousin, who called the police, did not agree with the internment. He found Brandon to be dangerous and unstable and wanted him to be put in prison to keep him away from his uncle and aunt and protect them. Unfortunately, Mike had excellent intuition. On that same day, Brandon was admitted to Riverside Kanchai Mental Health Facility to undergo an examination to determine if he posed a danger to himself or others. He stayed there for two days, but the mental health facility was overcrowded. Brandon spent most of his very short stay in the waiting room. He was still evaluated and received a diagnosis of mood disorder and substance abuse. Unfortunately, the doctors judged that he did not need to be detained and released him with a prescription. He was prescribed mood stabilizers and anti-anxiety medication. So, two days after the police detained him, Brandon found himself completely free. The hospital was later accused of hastening Brandon's discharge to free up a bed because it was overcrowded. On September 17, 2015, members of the staff gave Brandon a bus ticket, stating that his parents did not want him at home. What is quite incredible about this story is that Brandon had been institutionalized after assaulting his two parents. Two days later, the hospital deemed him fit to leave because they did not consider him to be a dangerous person. The hospital informed him that his parents did not want to see him, but no one bothered to inform the parents of Brandon's release. Unfortunately, once out of the hospital, Brandon had only one idea in mind, to return to his parents' house to confront them, as he believed that everything that had happened to him was their fault, and especially his father's fault. That day, his father and his uncle Ricky Henderson, a 58-year-old technician from the company ADT who had come to install a security system, were at the house. Also present was a certain Barry Swanson, age 62. Indeed, in order to protect themselves from their son, the parents decided to install a security system since his institutionalization. What is quite curious is that Melody refused to file a complaint against her son and was against his institutionalization. Nonetheless, the parents hurried to install an alarm system before his release, which was scheduled to happen 72 hours hours later. Ricky, Brandon's uncle, became concerned about the situation and visited his brother-in-law with the firm intention of convincing him to have Brandon enter a detoxification program after his mental health examination the following day. Meanwhile, Brandon took a bus to his parents' home, where they were completely unaware of his release. Upon arrival, he spotted his uncle Ricky, Mike's father, on the lawn talking on the phone with his son. Brandon did not pay attention and headed towards the front door. He immediately headed towards his room, grabbed one of his black baseball bats engraved with his name, and then found his father sitting in a chair in the living room. He approached him and struck him a terrible blow with the bat, shattering his skull and killing him instantly. Barry Swanson, the installer of the security system who was installing the surveillance cameras inside the house, attempted to stop Brandon. This Vietnam veteran, age 62, bravely intervened to stop him, but unfortunately, Brandon also attacked him and killed him with the baseball bat during the attack. Some cameras had already been installed at the time of the attack. During the trial, the recordings were later viewed and the victim's children filed a complaint against the company for failing to alert emergency services. 
While visually the recorded images do not show anything, sounds can be heard in the background without clearly identifying what is happening. Mike's father, who was still on the phone with his son, rushed to the Martins' home after the line was cut. Mike, alarmed, hurried to Martin's home to intervene, but his father too ended up being beaten with a baseball bat before his body was dragged into the garage. Unfortunately, he passed away two days later after being in a coma. Brandon, right after his rampage, stole the victim's wallets and phones. He took Barry's Ford Raptor van and went to have dinner as if nothing happened in a Carl's JR restaurant, an American fast food chain. Upon arrival, Mike could only witness the massacre and he immediately called 911. A team arrived at the scene and found Michael in his wheelchair in the living room and Barry, the alarm installer, was found dead in a pool of blood in the kitchen. There were bloodstains leading to the garage, where they found Ricky also lying in a pool of blood. Brandon had fled with Barry's truck after checking that there was no more danger inside the house and after calling for help. He contacted the company that installed the alarm to identify Barry's truck, which was then broadcasted. Michael Martinez, Barry Swanson, and Ricky Henderson were declared dead, and Ricky would succumb to his injuries two days later, early the next morning after the incident. The officer spotted Barry's truck and attempted to stop Brandon, but he fled, dodging several patrol vehicles. He eventually crashed into a car, then drove the truck into a house. Luckily, the woman inside was not hurt. Brandon hid near a window when the police arrived, rushed into a room at the back, removed the window screen, and attempted to escape by jumping through it. Corporal Jeffrey Bennett, a K-9 handler, was on his way to do a demonstration with his partner Khan when he heard the call on the radio. He wasn't far away and immediately headed to the scene. When he arrived, he found Brandon lying on his back, looking up at the sky, with his right hand hidden behind his back. The officer didn't know if they were armed and wanted to avoid any gunfire because a school was nearby. He asked Brandon to put his hands in the air if he didn't want the dog to attack him, but Brandon didn't comply with the officer's request. So, the officer gave the command to his male and want to attack, and he jumped and bit Brandon on the left tibia. Brandon struggled and managed to get up. He backed away, hitting Fakes several times in the face. Then he grabbed Fakes and slammed him to the ground, making him scream in pain. The corporal's dog helped by hitting Brandon several times with a baton. Brandon fell to the ground, but he continued to fight until he was finally immobilized and handcuffed. Brandon was finally unable to cause harm, much to the relief of Fakes' master. Fortunately, Fakes wasn't seriously hurt, and he continued to serve valiantly for five more years in the police canine unit. Fakes and Corporal Jeffrey Bennett retired together in April 2020. During his career, Fakes participated in more than 50 arrests and 500 assisted arrests. Brandon was taken to the hospital to treat his injuries. When he was arrested, he told the police that he had returned home and stumbled upon the bloody scene, but had nothing to do with it. He claimed that after he was released from the hospital, he took the bus to his parents' house to collect his belongings. When he arrived at the house, he found that his father, his uncle, and Barry, the alarm installer, had all been beaten to death. Since he had nothing to do with it, he grabbed the first keys he found and picked up the wallets. He took Barry's truck and went to eat calmly at a restaurant. He did not see fit to notify either the police or Nick. He said he tried to use the credit cards at four different gas stations. He eventually threw away the cards, wallets, and phones. Then he will stay for a while pretending to sleep in the van until early morning. When he was spotted by the police, he was on his way to his parents' house to drop off the car from Paris and exchange it for his uncle's car. In fact, there was no more gas in the car from Paris. He will then explain that when he saw the police, he panicked and tried to escape, which is why he jumped out of the window. The police officer who was questioning him will clarify that at the time of the attack, Ricky, his uncle, was on the phone with his son Mike, to whom he allegedly said that Brandon had just arrived. So, if Brandon had arrived at his parents' house and everyone was already dead, how is it possible that Ricky, who told her son that Brandon was there, knew about it. He will explain that when he arrived, he saw his uncle on the lawn, so he walked around the house, lay down on the ground in the driveway, and took a nap for about an hour. He then woke up and entered the house, where he found everyone dead. Unfortunately for him, the black baseball bat with his name engraved on it and covered in blood that was found at the scene turned out to be a piece of incriminating evidence. Brandon was then charged with three counts of murder and a whole host of other offenses. Brandon pleaded not guilty to three counts of murder and related charges. The Riverside County prosecutor sought the death penalty, while Brandon's defense argued that he suffered from a mental illness and therefore should not be subject to capital punishment. They maintained that Brandon had been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia in January 2013 and was still not receiving treatment. 
prosecutors describe Brandon Martin's behavior as fueled by drug use. Dr. Alan Abrams, a psychiatrist who examined Brandon's medical history for the defense, stated that he regularly consumed marijuana and had only taken cocaine, LSD, and mushrooms on a few occasions. The doctor will state that he had a very severe case of schizophrenia and that he doubted drug use played a significant role in the severity of his illness or the crime against his own father. Dr. Saul O'Mans, the psychologist who met with Mrs. Grand Gonis three times in person in the weeks preceding the murders, will declare that he had never seen any signs of paranoid schizophrenia or similar conditions. It was revealed during the trial that Brandon had an unlimited hatred for his father, who was black, he blamed him for not being white like his mother. Brandon had a genuine self-hatred and did not accept his identity as a biracial person. For many years, Brandon used creams to lighten his skin. He wanted to become less black and wanted to be white. This self-hatred, combined with his psychiatric disorders that were not taken seriously and his daily drug use, led Brandon to destroy the lives of three innocent men in a fit of rage. His mother testified as the final witness to plead for her son's life. She said, I do not want to lose another member of my family. It would be a dagger in my heart. On November 4, 2020, Brandon Martin was found guilty of three premeditated murders after a lengthy hearing and deliberation. The jury ultimately chose not to sentence him to death, and he was instead sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The families of the victims will sue Riverside County, alleging that Brandon was released and misdiagnosed by authorities. The trial confirmed that Brandon had not been properly treated for his condition. The families of the victims are suing the county for negligence. After evaluating his mental health, the authorities determined that he did not need further treatment and released him just hours before the massacre. In addition, the plaintiffs also accused the DT and the defendant's men of negligence. Martin's parents rushed to install a security system as soon as they learned that their son was going to be released from the hospital. Barry Swanson was on the phone with his office finalizing the installation when Brandon killed him. Brandon is currently serving his life sentence while the families of the victims try to move forward as best they can. They are still waiting for an acknowledgement of the wrongs committed by the psychiatric center and the security companies. According to the information found, he is not receiving medical treatment and refuses to communicate with anyone in his cell. The room is covered in food and excrement, and he doesn't even sleep in his bed, but on the floor. When we are faced with these kinds of people struggling with heavy psychopathologies, especially if it is one of our loved ones, the best thing we can do for them, in order to protect them and others, is to try to have them accompanied. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to follow for more crime stories.